Intermediate Accounting 16, Dilutive Securities Earnings Per Share. This is Ken Boyd, the owner of Singlist Test Preparation. Here's our Facebook page, our email, and our website, and my book that is coming out, Cost Accounting for Dummies, in March of 2013. I do this video in two sections. The first is dilutive earnings per share and the question that's about the earnings side of the equation first. What would earnings per common share look like if all the securities that could be converted are converted into common stock? Just like when you put uh, chocolate mix in milk and it dilutes it, uh, more common shares outstanding dilutes the number of the dollar amount of earnings you have per share and again please keep in mind that this applies to common stock common stock so here's our problem compute dilutive earnings per share as of 1231 and we're just going to do the the earnings side we're not going to do the share side necessarily as you'll see so our net income is six hundred thousand dollars we own a convertible we have a convertible bond outstanding the face amounts five million dollars it matures in ten years and it's issued at a discount. We had to sell the bond at less than the face amount of five million to entice people to buy it. And that's an additional expense. The difference between what we sold the bond for and five million dollars is an additional expense to us since we're the issuer. So we have amortization, amortization expense, and for this example it's twenty thousand dollars more per year. The stated rate is the rate that's on the face of the certificate, that's 9%. The bond was issued to yield 10%. Again, the investor gets a higher yield than the stated interest rate because they pay a discount. So now the conversion details. Each $1,000 bond is convertible into 20 shares of common stock. And there's a corporate income tax rate that we'll use in a minute of 25%. So the first step in figuring out the earnings per share diluted is determine how net income changes. And the way we do that is to get rid of the impact of preferred stock. Preferred stock differs from common stock. Dilutive earnings per share deals with common shares only. So if we've paid a dividend on a convertible preferred, we add that back to the earnings calculation. And we also add back the after-tax interest that we pay, we as the issuer pay, on convertible preferred debt. And that also takes into account the amortization of the discount. We have a discount in this case or a premium. So the next step is, is to set up a formula where we take our starting net income of 600000 We didn't need to make any adjustment for preferred stock. That wasn't mentioned. But the question assumes that the debt that's outstanding is preferred debt. So there's our interest paid, five million times nine percent, four hundred fifty thousand dollars for the whole year. We add back the annual discount amortization, that's an additional expense for the year of twenty thousand. We get a subtotal of four hundred seventy thousand dollars. But we now have to adjust for the after-tax effect of that 470. So what we do is we multiply 470,000 times 1 minus the tax rate, which would be 20, 75%. So what we actually add back to net income is 352,500. So the 600,000 plus the 352,500, A plus B, you'll see on the right, is 952,500. That is our new or adjusted net income for the purposes of calculating dilutive earnings per share. And the last step would be, and you'll see it on the next page, we would adjust the weighted average shares of common stock. So we would have adjusted net income divided by the adjusted weighted average shares of common stock. Let me jump to the next example which deals with the number of shares. Dilutive earnings per share is still our subject. And in this case, the question is to compute the number of shares outstanding for dilutive earnings per share. And in this example, we have two things happening. We have additional shares issued, common shares, 
and we have stock options outstanding and this example assumes that they get exercised. I always suggest when you're doing weighted average shares that you set up the table as you see here on the screen. I put the date off to the left, the change in the number of shares in the next column, the total shares outstanding in the middle, and then off to the right I have uh, the period, the number of months that those shares were outstanding. So for example, January 1st, 300,000 shares are outstanding. And those shares are out, total number of shares, 300,000, are outstanding for six months. And my note off to the right is shares outstanding at the beginning of the year, and they're outstanding for six months. July 1st, if you look off to the right, we issue 50,000 more shares of stock for cash. So, total number of shares goes up to 350,000. Those shares are outstanding from July 1st for the rest of the year. So if I take 300,000 shares for six months plus 350,000 shares for six months and I divide by two, I see that my weighted average share is outstanding is 325. The last adjustment I need to make is for the stock options. And what I'm going to do is add the shares that are repurchased with stock option proceeds back into the treasury. <coughs> Excuse me. And those are 10,000. Now, we're going to take a minute and explain how that works. Stock options indicate that people have the right, the option to buy shares at a certain price for a certain period of time. And for this question, the shares unexercised, in other words, they still own the options and haven't done anything yet, total 40,000 shares. The strike price is the price at which the option holder can buy the shares, 15. And finally, off to the right, the average market price is during the year, what's the average selling price, market price, of the common shares. It's assumed in the question that the stock options are exercised at the beginning of the year, which means they're outstanding for all 12 months. And the method that we use to calculate the shares that get added back to weighted average for our weighted average calculation is the treasury stock method. Treasury stock method assumes that proceeds from the stock option sales are used to repurchase shares near the treasury. So the first question is, well, how much is that in cash? Well, we multiply, assume that all 40,000 options get exercised and that the option holders pay $15 a share. So, they send in, they the shareholders send in $600,000 to buy shares. And now the question is, if the company has to go out into the marketplace and buy the shares back, they would pay the average market price of 20. So the shares they end up repurchasing are the proceeds, the cash that came in from the stock option people exercising, 600,000, divided by the average market price when they go out into the market to buy the shares, which is 30,000. 600 divided by 20 is 30. So now here's the crux of it. The stock option shares that they buy are 40,000. The shares we repurchase are only 30,000. So the difference is we need another 10,000 shares that we need to issue to fulfill the 40,000 required shares for the stock option holders. We need to issue them 40,000. We only rebought 30,000 based on the market price we need to issue another 10,000. And those additional shares get added to the weighted average shares outstanding. It should really say shares reissued, not repurchased. Shares issued based on the stock option proceeds. And again, we have to issue 10,000 more so we can meet our obligation to issue 40,000 shares when we only went into the marketplace and bought 30,000. So what you've done is you've calculated 335,000 weighted average shares outstanding that would be used 
to calculate your dilutive earnings per share. So this tab talked about weighted average shares outstanding. The prior tab talked about calculating the adjusted net income, which is right here. So you have both pieces of dilutive earnings per share. That's the end of Intermediate Accounting 16A. For video textbooks, both material not on YouTube and uh, combinations into 30-minute and hour-long videos, you can contact me. My YouTube channel, Ken Boyd STL, you can email for a complete list of the videos on YouTube that's updated. For live tutoring and chat sessions, here's the website. And the book, Cost Accounting for Dummies, will be available Amazon, Barnes & Noble Online, March 2013. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.